Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. Any opinions or comments made by any guest are their own, and they do not necessarily reflect any of the presenters' or network's opinions. This man in the saucer, can you describe him? Well, sir, he was small and skinny. He had a... his head was pointed, came to a very sharp point. He had long green hair. His eyes were a sort of purplish red. He had large ears which were formed like an antenna. His teeth were perfect, but uh, spread far apart. And I noticed, too, a jacket of uh, some sort of spun glass and bright red metallic shoes. You say this all took place in a few seconds. Mr. Nagelschmidt, can you tell me what color tie I'm wearing? I'm sorry, sir. I didn't notice. You mean to say you can remember everything about this man from the spaceship, his hair, the color of his eyes, the clothing he was wearing, and yet, after all this time, you can't tell me the color of my tie? But you didn't come out of a flying saucer. This is Nick Pope, and you're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the UK's biggest paranormal network. And this is Paranormal Dimensions with David Young. For me, this is the kind of show that I like doing most, where you basically just have a freewheeling discussion, have a chance to go off on topics. That's what's going to make you an outstanding player in the field. Just keep doing it. Hello and welcome to the show once again. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for the introduction, Nick. And thank you for those very kind words, Peter Robbins. I have another wonderful guest for the show today. It's the very well-known Mary Rodwell. But just before we start the main show, I'd just like to say thank you for the emails and messages, etc. that you send me. I'd just like to say most of the uh, messages I get are sort of like suggestions for future guests, etc. Um... Some of the guests I've already had on previously on, on other shows, um, some interesting suggestions also come along. I did have a suggestion for someone who's not with us anymore, um, so that might be a bit difficult. But apart from that, if you would like to get in touch with me at any time, my email address is davidyoung2qn at yahoo.co.uk. That's davidyoung2qn, and that's all one word, at yahoo.co.uk. Okay, today's guest, Mary Rodwell. Now, many people around the world, from all walks of life, believe themselves to be in regular contact with beings from outer space. Mary Rodwell, trained nurse, midwife and therapist, works with individuals said to be having these remarkable experiences. She claims they are not products of overactive imaginations, quite the opposite. They are real and happening to normal, healthy people. Some people are aware of it, but many are completely in the dark, as ET encounters occur in numerous ways. The process of waking up to this multidimensional reality is not always easy, but the results are positively life-changing, such as spiritual transformation and expanded awareness. Are you ready to ask, am I experiencing alien contact? Okay, her latest book, The New Human, Awakening to Our Cosmic Heritage, uh, just before the introduction... There's a few lines by Mike Oram, who wrote a book called Does It Rain in Other Dimensions? That's Mike Oram of UK. And what it says is, my real parents are in space. It says, Mum, you are my parents as far as bringing me onto this planet, but my real parents are in space. I come from somewhere out there. Something of great importance is going to happen on this earth, not in your lifetime, but in mine. It will affect all units of consciousness whether they are mineral, vegetable, animal or man. It is to do with global consciousness, a vast change of consciousness, 
and that is why I'm here at this time to experience this change. Then that's Mike Oram at four years old. Then it goes on. The light beings told me the energy was heading our way and the essence of that energy was light and this light would be of a frequency that would repair our DNA. They said it would make us more complete and who we really are. This would enable us to have a different reality by moving frequency. When this is, I do not know. But if I go with my feelings, then I would have to say it's just around the corner. So that's from Does It Rain in Other Dimensions by Mike Oram. That's, it, that's in uh, Mary Rodwell's book, The New Human, uh, just before the introduction. So that kind of describes a little bit as to where this um, show will be going um, and that kind of conversation. So, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mary Rodwell. Hello Mary, welcome to the show. David, an absolute pleasure. Lovely to meet you again as you reminded me that we met in Hull some years ago. We did very briefly and, and as I was saying to you, we, uh, you signed a couple of your, your, your two books, The New Human and Awakening. Uh, you kindly signed them for me and they're very interesting books indeed I must say and as, as was your talk <laughs> and it was um I, I was, that was actually I'd, I'd heard about you uh, well obviously for many years but that was the first chance I had to actually come and speak, see you speak I know you get around quite a bit but I think it's uh, trying to get to the same places every time it's not not always easy <laughs> but also you've probably not been out of trouble very much lately well, David, actually, I haven't missed it because you're quite right. I was, you know, every one to two months I was off somewhere else and mm. it got really tiring because I did, you know, lots of places in the US, I, you know, I, and also um, Brazil a couple of times in one year as well as Hong Kong um, and, you know, various places in the Med. I'd done Malta at one point and a whole range of other places. So actually, it's been quite nice. To be at home, I mean, a lot of the conferences you're probably aware of have had to go online mm. because of the fact that, you know, unless you're actually in the country, you can't get to them. And I haven't actually missed, you know, all the stress of traveling, although I do miss not meeting the people, you know, yeah. all the beautiful souls you meet in these conferences. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean by the stress of traveling. It's not a pleasure at all. <laughs> you know, and I think we ought to point out that you're speaking from Australia and I'm in the UK, <laughs> so we've got the magic of the internet to help us with that with that one. But, uh, and uh, as, as I was just saying to you, it's sweltering hot here and uh, I understand it's winter in Australia and I was assuming it was as hot as it is here. or It usually is. I, I get the picture that Australia is always hot, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, you are. If you're somewhere in the Blue Mountains or anywhere around there, they often have snow around this time of year. So, um, but here I'm subtropical. Um, you know, we grow pineapples and mangoes down, you know, in the Ooh. garden. Um, it's just by line with the, the Great Barrier Reef. So, um, but it does get cool in the mornings. It gets as low as maybe, oh, 15 degrees Celsius, right. which is... That's warm cold. here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's quite a nice, pleasant temperature here. But uh, yeah, but pineapples and mangoes, well, are two of my favourite fruits. It's lovely. <laughs> but anyway, Mary, I guess we better um, start. I'd like to actually talk about um, a little bit about your your earlier book, Awakening. Um, it's uh, it's how extraterrestrial contact can transform your life. Would you like to tell us a little bit about what made you um, write that book? Absolutely. As you know, I'm a counsellor, um, a professional counsellor and hypnotherapist. And what happened was when I finally found, discovered that, I think it was in 1995, uh, when my first client, someone you will know in the UK, Ellis Taylor was my very right, first yes. client. Yep. Uh, and L came to me and he said, look, you know, there's no support groups for this, for this. People just think you're a loony and said, you know, I've heard you're open minded. You know, can you help? And the, that was really the start because Ellis is so articulate mm. and he was obviously, you know, um, there was there was no sense that there was something weird with Ellis at all. He's very grounded. He's very um, articulate, as I say, and he was having marks on his body, shaved areas and mm. what have you. And that my my delving down the rabbit hole i mean luckily i'd read a couple of books um previously 
very um, soon before Ellis came to see me, and one was an abduction by Dr. John Mack, the professor of psychiatry at Harvard University, and uh, he wrote Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens. And being a professor of psychiatry, you don't dismiss that very lightly. And no. then, of course, communion with the Strieber. And then it started the ball rolling because Ellis came. Then two weeks later, a lady came and told me she was having experiences completely, again, out of the blue. I met a social worker that was having experiences, and we started a support group where 12 people turned up, our very first support group. And I got to understand this was a lot more common than I ever imagined it was and it was by the time I wrote um, Awakening I had then been seeing regularly doing uh, experience of groups etc etc and a, a lot of the questions came up which were the same like how do I know this is real how do I know I'm not imagining things you know what does it mean how do I know this is you know this is you know, what about these strange um, experiences? You know, how do I understand them? What about the fear? How do I deal with it? all those kinds of questions kept coming up time and time again. And I realized that many people were afraid to go and see a psych uh, psychologist hmm. or and certainly not a psychiatrist because of what can happen when you do. So I thought, well, if I can give them a self help resource book then they can work through this process of coming to terms with their experiences um, on their own if they have to, with lots of resources and things. And that was really how it started. Each time some question came up, like implants, missing pregnancies, or psychic abilities, all these things came up with people having experiences. So I did a chapter literally on everything I could think of that would make sense and help people validate and come to terms with their experiences. So to me, that was what was important because there was no book out there that was taking people through that process. Mm. There were case studies, there were, you know, and what have you, but there was nothing saying this is how it works or this is what the issues people are dealing with when they have this experience. And we were talking just a few minutes ago, David, about the fact, you know, that are you a believer or not a believer? And I said, no, it's not about belief. This is a reality that people experience. Mm. They don't believe in aliens and then have the experiences. Many of them have told me they didn't even, they're not, they never even watched Star Trek or they, you know, yeah. they've never even looked at the alien um, phenomena at all. So this isn't coming from a belief whatsoever. This is coming for many people from the experience where they end up having to believe it because it's real for them. Yeah, I agree with you. I've heard that so many times, that you become a believer when it happens to you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you say, you're not just a believer then, you're, you're an experiencer too by then. I was quite interested about the implants that you were mentioning. Did you come across many people with implants? Yes, and there's, you know, I wrote a chapter on it because there are the solid ones that, you know, Dr. Roger Lear, who became a good friend and colleague, he took it before he died, passed away. Mm. He'd taken about 15, filmed them, had them investigated. Some were um, biological, some were um, magnetic. There was a whole range of ones that he had taken out um, from various people. But there are also something called, um, well, I call them uh, energy implants, if you like. They're almost like uh, an energetic implant. And some of those can be moved through working with someone. You can actually get them to move these energetic implants. And I, I talk about it in depth in, in the book itself. But the more solid ones, obviously, if you think you have one, you need to go to someone who's open to looking into it for you. And there's, unfortunately, there's not many mm. uh, medical shows that would do that. But I think there are some that are following with Dr. Lear's Leah's work and um, are still removing some of them. But not all of them, David, are negative either. Um, some of them, I remember um, Tracy Taylor talking about her implant in her arm. Um, and she said it, that it was actually a conduit for helping her do her drawings. And she, you know, she found it very positive. And others, when they've had hypnosis um, and have uh, found out why the implant was put there, Often it's been very helpful or it's been a, a way of being supportive of um, their connection to these beings. So 
you know, there's a lot of judgment around, oh, it's an implant, it's got to be bad. Not at mm. all, uh, except for maybe the ones from the military, and that's a whole other story. Yeah. Well, I was going to actually ask you, who's actually putting these implants? Uh, are they done by, because of alien abductions, obviously, with, with some of them? And like you said, we've got the military implants. So uh, what, for what purposes are they being put there? Um, I was going to say to you, are they in some instances evil? But and, and as you say, and, and sometimes it seems to help people as well. Do you think there's some some sort of a medical intervention sometimes? I one of the interesting things, um, as you know, I was one of the co-founders of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation, mm. and in the surveys mm. that we did, in terms of, of um, uh, 600 questions, I think six to 700 questions um, over you know 4,200 people. Um, and it's all in, the, you know, the book Beyond UFOs. And in there, what we discovered, and this is all new information because there's never been a study like it ever before um, this one, was 50% of people on board craft have healing procedures. And there's a whole chapter in Beyond UFOs of people that have had these healing procedures and some of them from very serious illnesses as well. Mm. And this is not generally known. You know, Preston Dennett um, has written about a book called um, UFO Healings, but he also did a chapter in the book. So this is what people don't realize, that there are um, some of these implants have been to help help with healing. A lot of the negative ones are primarily, I believe, military because they've been abducted by the, you know, by these covert agencies. And there's a, you know, that's a whole nother ball game. And that's, a, you know, quite different in terms of why they're putting implants there. Mm. Now, do you think the military are actually working with aliens in, in, in some respects? Well, it's a very hard one to know because I've got no, you know, what I would call solid da data. I know some people, when they're taken by the military in these underground bases, have seen what they believe to be non-human intelligences as as well, such mm. as reptilians, such as greys, for example. But we also know that, it, that what is happening with some of these, they could be what they're called um, programmed life forms that aren't actually ET, but are being cloned from genetic material from these intelligences. So whether or not they're working with some of them and that's real, or whether these are just clones that are programmed by the military, it's hard to know. But I know that some whistleblowers they have said they've seen these program life forms, which some of them are greys and some of them are reptilians. And they were saying that they are actually not true ET. They're, they're just cloned. So it goes into a really dark rabbit hole where mm. all sorts of things that we don't know for sure. But of course, you know, some of the whistleblowers have said that certain intelligences have worked with our military and there's been a, a trade. That may be so, but... I mean, I really don't know, David, for sure, any of that. Mm. Now, I know you mentioned reptilians. Now, um, as I understand it, reptilians are on a different dimensional plane. Um, so if, do they actually, are they on a, a physical plane as well? Um, you know, uh, do you see what I'm saying? About, uh, so if they can interact with the military, they must be on our physical plane as well. Oh, absolutely. And I've uh, an interesting thing with reptilians, that they, they, you know, they sometimes get a very bad press, but I have come to understand that there are many people that have had very positive, loving encounters with some reptilians. And Barbara Lamb, who's a very well known in ufology, mm. actually told me of an experience she had when she walked into a house once and there was this seven foot reptilian and all that she got from him was love and uh, acceptance. And she has most amazing experience. So. I believe that there are physical ones, but we also, what people don't always understand is that we're interacting with more than just physical beings. Sometimes they're interdimensional, extra-dimensional, trans-dimensional, and there's even a suggestion some of them have come from our future. So, you know, it's not so easy to put them into a black and white box anyway. And of course, a lot mix up. Um, I don't realize that, you know, somebody may see what they, because they're more religious, perhaps see an angel, but somebody else may see the same being and just call it a light being. So we, we've got this whole confusion out of perceptions and our programming that, that decides, 
you know, what it may be, whereas in fact um, it can be a whole range of things because some of them certainly are coming from other dimensions. Yeah. Well, I know Elias has spoken about reptilians quite a lot, hasn't he, in his, when he gives these talks? Um, and he gives a, a kind of a scary aspect to it. Do, do you agree? Look, um, certainly they, they can look very scary, but what I've, I've said to people, when they've had experiences with various different beings, what I've said to them is, take the notice of what anybody else says. What is your experience or your feeling around this particular, you know, whether it's a grey, whether it's a reptilian or humanoid or whatever it is, what are you feeling from that being? Because that's accurate for you, not necessarily what other people are saying, because other people may very well be judging them simply because they look scary. doesn't mean they're bad. Um, you know, there are, uh, and it's like the greys, there's all sorts of things said about different greys, um, you know, the Zetas. I've heard, excuse me, I've heard that there's at least, from one lady, there's at least 165 species of grey. Wow. So yeah. you can't just pick a grey out there and say, well, they're all bad. Mm. In fact, I've many people who've had the most loving experiences with greys and others that have been terrified of them. So what I, I can only say from all those, I've worked with about three and a half thousand families and children and um, people with experiences is that there's a whole matrix of experience with different beings and many that are not talked about like crystalline beings, geometric beings and, and of course the mantis are another one and the lion and felines uh, for example, there's ant-like beings as well as the mantis, there's a whole range of humanoids, blue beings etc etc. So what I say to people when they see or experience one of these beings or intelligences is what are you feeling from them? What's your sense for you? And that's the thing to trust because ultimately that's all we've ever got because everyone else can be scared for all sorts of different reasons. It doesn't mean that just because something looks a bit ugly to us that it may necessarily be bad. You know, we've, we're very discriminatory on this planet, you know. Mm. It depends on what you look like and how people judge you we've got to get over that but many of the people that you've spoken to do they think they're going mad in some way or or, or are they certain of what they're seeing and they need someone to to talk to about it it's a good question david and there is a, quite a percentage that are questioning their sanity simply because if they've ever talked about it the family switches off or looks very fearful or their partner does or they say you need to go and see someone because, you know, plainly, you know, there's something wrong with you. And the sad thing for me is that a number of them have gone and ended up in uh, taking medication or ending up in a hospital because of it. And in awakening, I mean, there's a, the story of the 19-year-old that contacted me who said at 14, her name, I called her Kathy, at 14 told me that she had gone to the doctor and said she was seeing aliens and he said there's you, you know that you are schizophrenic and he loaded mm. her with all this medication she didn't try to take her life several times until she got to 19 where she saw a talk show a u.s talk show where they were talking about this and she realized maybe she wasn't crazy after all and in my book awakening i tackle that in a whole chapter how do you know you're not crazy as a way of showing people how you work out whether or not this is a reality. And the truth is that, you know, when people um, get to understand more, often they're less frightened. They start to understand a little bit more about what's going on. They start to realize they're not alone for a start. Um, and then they start to understand that some of the things they're experiencing, other people experience as well. And that's why I run my resource, because I'm able to to put their mind at rest if they say, well, I've experienced this or I've experienced that. I can say, well, that's very common. That's part of the pattern. And one of the things I do, David, when people contact me is I send them out my questionnaire because that shows them the many ways you can have contact. And there'll be some that are very comfortable with it. They've known it all their lives. It's never been threatening. It's never been fearful. They've been more scared about being on a planet where people are still very... Um, primitive as they think mm. uh, and they don't feel like they belong here they feel like you know their home is somewhere else 
Um, and, you know, that they really struggle with being on the planet because they've got a sense of coming from somewhere else, like some other planet or some other dimension or whatever. And their biggest problem is having to keep quiet because they feel so different to everyone else. To the others that really struggle to believe this is a reality and that we're not alone because they've been programmed all through their lives only to trust their five senses. Mm. So as soon as they feeling things intuitively or starting seeing balls of light or energy fields or start seeing the beings, then they immediately think, well, there's, you know, either there's something wrong with my eyes or I'm going mad. Yeah. So I get both of both spec- uh, ends of the spectrum, David, to be honest. Yeah, I can understand it. I mean, is there any sort of a psychological test you could, you, you're able to do on it? Um, you know, a lot of physical tests and things. Are there any sort of apparatus and things that you can use? I don't know. I'm sure that um, what Dr. Mack did was he gave them all the psychological testing, the ones that he worked with and wrote about in both his books. So he made sure that they were, you know, psychologically sound. And, you know, he had no doubts in the end that they were. Um, um, but the, you know, the only thing you could actually tell would be from, I suppose, the fact that um, there's been a couple of, a couple of, more than a couple really have told me that their DNA has, there's been um, a, an unknown, unknown component in their DNA um, when they've had that done. Oh. Um, the other thing is um, the implants, some of them are solid and can be seen on X-ray for sure, which would also indicate a reality. But the biggest reality more than anything else, and I've said this so many times, is the way people change after their experiences. And what we discovered with the Dr. Edgar Mitchell um, surveys was 85% of the 4,200 people noticed a psycho-spiritual change in themselves where they became more sensitive, where they found that they felt more connected to the planet, where they wanted a more holistic lifestyle. Often they changed their diet. Some started doing drawings of the beings or um, doing strange, unusual artwork or strange symbols or coming out with these these languages we call star languages or light language, or, for example. So there were a whole range of uh, creative expressions that were indicating something very profound had happened to them over this experience. And it's not something you do after a fantasy. You don't change in amazingly profound ways where they become more empathic and more connected to people, wanting to do healing or working with, uh, working, uh, um, doing energy work and, and what have you. Mm. All, all these changes happen after contact. And there is your evidence in the changes in individuals and people. All right. And I suppose a major question comes out of that is, why us? Are we anything special in the universe? You know, I mean, because there's, obviously there's billions of planets out there, I assume. <laughs> I'm not seeing them physically. But, um, yeah, why, why would it be us? Or do you think it would be a universal thing that this, con- this contact is p- taking place? Well, let me describe what an eight-year-old to- told me when she been taken a few days previously on board a craft where she was taken and shown how to use her psychic abilities in what I call the space schools. She explained to me they showed her genetic engineering, how they were uh, mixing species um, with indigenous DNA on many planets. They told her they did this on many, many planets, including Earth, that they would take the indigenous you know, uh, being, if you like, or or whoever was natural to the planet, and they would add their own DNA to upgrade that particular species. And they were telling her they did it in on many star systems all over the cosmos. And that makes us one of, uh, um, if you like, a program. And everything that I think I'm hearing about is that we have this, um, addition of 225 um, genes in uh, to our DNA that nobody can explain, to give you a bit of an example. And there's been many of those that have had communication with the beings have been told at least 12 
inserts of DNA from these intelligences has happened um, to create Homo sapiens sapiens. And of course, it all ties into the gods that came down. And, and really, we have to start seeing this in a modern understanding, which is the gods were, were in fact, ETs. They mm. weren't gods at all. They were just um, beings with a, a higher, a better technology than we had. And they would have seemed like gods, but it's in our DNA. One of the interesting things that um, I really valued from Command Sergeant Robert Dean, who was well known by anyone in ufology, who this lovely bloke finally passed away in his 80s, explained that he went on and he was in. Um, he knew about all the ET stuff from the military because it was one of those high um, beyond secret cosmic secret type. Um, information, they, the, the military were already admitting they knew that were several species that were interact, interacting with us, but he'd never admitted until he, the last few years of his life that he'd been on board craft hmm. and that he'd actually been told that we were at least a mix of 12 different extraterrestrial species. And that was, you know, the first time he'd ever admitted as far as I was aware, that he'd actually been, publicly that is, that he'd actually been on the spacecraft and had this information given to him. And our, our DNA is, 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 the, is the mystery, really, because even Dr. Francis Crick, co-founder of the DNA Molecule, said that he believed that we'd been created by an, inter, uh, you know, an extraterrestrial species and, and, and talked about that in Life Itself, the book he wrote. Mm, interesting. I, I mean, I'm very interested in the ancient alien theory anyway. Um, having met Eric Von Danica a few times myself, he's a very interesting character. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and also the ancient buildings and everything. I mean, is it your actual belief that the aliens did help build those buildings? Um, you know, the, the structures and the pyramids, etc. I'm pretty certain they did. And I'll give you a very interesting little testimony from a five-year-old whose mother was reading him a story about the pyramids and how the slaves went to build the pyramids and what have you. And he said to her, that's all wrong, Mum. That's not true. Because I, I was there. Ah. And they changed the density of objects, large and small, and they levitated them into place, he explained. <laughs> and this was a, this was a five-year-old yeah. explaining what actually happened. And there's, you know, there's, interestingly, there are a lot of those that are um, aware of the fact that this was really the reason they could move these huge blocks was actually through levitation. Mm. I, I actually believe that and I agree with it because uh, when, when you look at the size of some of these structures and, and the size of the blocks, no way could they be lifting those great big blocks up slopes the way, they were, you know, the way they're describing. So I just can't see that. Um, that description myself, you know, not with ropes and pulleys and just manpower. I just don't think anyone could do that, you know. I don't think we could do it today with all No, that I we agree have. with you. I don't think we could. I mean, I, I wish somebody would actually, I think somebody did try to set that up, didn't they? And I, I don't know how successful it was because, I mean, even back then they didn't have like logs. If you assume they pulled these slubs, these big rocks along on logs, they didn't have any logs back then. It was all palm trees, so. You know, it's, uh, but I guess that's a whole different sort of uh, ball game we're talking about there. But so it's an interesting subject. I just wanted your sort of take on it. Uh, I certainly believe there was ancient aliens anyway. But I can't remember if you've been on. I think you have appeared on ancient aliens, haven't you? Or am I wrong? No, no, I, I have on the Gaia um, side of things as well. But I have been in a number of documentaries, but I haven't done the ancient aliens one, oh, although well. I was asked. But I'll tell you why I'm so fascinated by it. Apart from Hidden Archaeology by Michael Cremo, I don't know if you've read any of his stuff. I've heard. Where he talks. Yeah, I've heard of um, him. Yeah. Amazing book um, on what's found in um, coal and what have you. Nails have been found in coal mm. and what have you. Millions, millions of years um, before we're supposed to have, um, you know, come to this planet or whatever. And he says that, you know, there's been civilizations, uh, you know, literally in, in the millions, not not a couple of hundred thousand and all the rest of it that we're, we're, we've been told about as well. But there are so many anomalies found in, you know, in rock and in coal and what have you that are literally millions of years old. 
So, you know, that's just a start. But, the, you know, the, bo- the bottom line is that, we, you know, we're not told the truth, David. You know that. Yeah. We're not told the truth on our origins. And the, you I don't know, think we're told we, the truth about anything, to be honest. <laughs> you, everything, you know, is an edited truth. Mm. And this is the one thing I think that I've learned by being involved in this phenomena is that I've had to start again, look into everything with um, a lot more determination to find the truth. And if you look hard enough, you can see how much we've been lied to about everything, mm. <laughs> literally everything. It's you, you literally have to start again. And that's made me very distrustful now of, of any of the, you know, the documentaries that are out there and what have you, because it's all an edited truth. And it's, you know, they do a little bit of digging and, and a little bit here and there. And we're supposed to take that as it is. And of course, with, with the wars and all the rest of it, the only one who writes about the wars are the winners. So you, you don't actually even know the truth of the, our, our history anyway. Yeah. And I think with the DNA particularly, there have been a number of whistleblowers that have looked at human DNA and said you can see where the DNA is being spliced and put back together again. And there's a number of whistleblowers that have actually admitted that, you know, that we we are created. And they said if they can talk about if they talked about it publicly, they'd be strung up from the nearest tree. Mm. So you can't speak truth. Because as soon as it's against the narrative of what you know the the, the popular narrative, you're you're you you're you're ignored and dismissed. Yeah, I mean as you know the world's in quite an upheaval at the moment. Um, are the <laughs> would you think the aliens are actually sitting back and watching what's going on, or is there some sort of uh, alien evil alien influence who is actually causing it? <laughs> and, and yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about. You don't want to go too too far into the subject, but uh... well, I'll try not to get too far down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people have wondered about the ones that literally have the power over. You know, we call them the elite. We call them a lot of different names: the cabal, all these different ones. Are they influenced by negative entities? That could be, you know, um, and it's suggested maybe, you know, reptilians, Draco, and a few others mm. that don't have our well-being. That's quite possible because people are influenced by the non, on well, the non-physical realm. We know that by entities and this kind of thing can be, um, they can uh, be influenced by them. That's that's of course quite possible. Um, but at the same time, uh, we, you know, we hear that they are. This, this this elite do do very um, work with energy, do various magical things that um, for controlling people as well. So it may be part of all of that. I don't dismiss anything to do with working with energy in a negative sense rather than a positive sense. I personally do think, apart from the fact that I'm pretty aware that the ones at the top do not have our, our best interests at heart, and the only reason that I say that is because of what I have perceived just looking into the corruption on this planet and it is rife in the uh, the, uh, the echelons uh, the higher echelons of our society hmm. it is absolutely rife and you know you you know that goes from the governments right through to the you know big pharma to corporations to banks to you know that their their mandate isn't for humanity's best interest, their mandate is for their own power and greed. So, you know, what do you get at the end of it? You get the rest of us having to survive or, or work around their control. Yeah. I mean, do you feel that there's a there's a, a major battle against good and, with good and evil, um, you know, in the spiritual realm going on? Um, you know, because that's what I've, I've understood from a few other people. Yeah, that's kind of the way I see it myself, um, that there's some massive battle going on. Uh, I don't know how you see it. I absolutely do see that. I have no doubts whatsoever that what's going on now is um, a time of awakening for humanity to either finally take back um, its rightful heritage or or lose it. And it's being asked of us all to stand in our truth. And, you know, this is this is the big one. You know, they, you know, people are calling it the third world war. Mm. And it's all this um, this uh, I'm going to use the word scam. 
um, that's that's been put out there, and it's fr- using fear to um, put us all back in our box. And this is this is how it works. And you know, I believe even with the the UFO phenomena that we're really, you know, as a shaman, the shaman has to transcend their human fears to be um, able to operate in a multi dimensional universe and we're being tasked to do exactly the same we're being tasked to transcend human fears our human fears so we can be part of a new awakened society and that's exactly what i think is going on now is are you going to buy into the fear and stop it doing you doing what you've come here to do and that speak your truth and live your truth because if we want a future for our children and our grandchildren, we really have now got to do that. Hmm. We have got to stop, you know, because they're saying silence is compl- uh, compliance. Yeah. You know, this is the bottom line. You know, do you sit by and you say, well, it's nothing to do with me or I can't do anything or whatever. You know, if we do that, we are not going to change what is really very wrong and what's going on on the planet now. And anyone who's done any research will see enough to see the red flags there and I mean I'm a nurse and a midwife and I can tell you what I can smell a rat when it comes to what's going on yeah. here um, but you don't need to have that I mean it's it's actually all out there if you look yeah I think a lot of us smell a, 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 a very smelly rat at least a year ago <laughs> yeah with, with everything that's happening that's a lot of, but I think that actually brings us quite nicely into your next book the new human and the awakening of our cosmic heritage it's kind of where you were coming from there, wasn't it? Well, the reason I wrote that was I was getting so many amazing stories from children who were not being hypnotized, that were talking to their parents about their experiences. They were, some of them were talking about um, their past lives coming from other planets, um, what form they took, why they'd come and incarnated into this planet. One young lad told his mum that he had, he was a blue being. He d- decided to come to this planet for the first time because he had certain skills that will help him deal with the pollution on this planet. Um, other kids talked about going on board craft and being shown how to use abilities, their psychic abilities. They talked about using their own energies. Um, learning how uh, learning complex subjects such as physics origin of the species cosmology etc etc and these are ages from five you know five upwards and some of the subjects they were talking about were really complex so I felt really strongly that because the parents didn't know what to do um, about these kids what to say to them or how to help them It was um, more and more, I thought, the more that I heard it, it had such an integrity because it wasn't programmed. It was a a clarity that came without any form of uh, manipulation or whatever. And it was talking about a truth, a truth that we're not alone, that we have all come from other places to incarnate on this planet and explained, you know, um, more about our greater heritage where many of us are are literally connected to many of these intelligences that we are hearing about because they're in fact the family as one eight-year-old told me about the mantis beings he he said they're my family and when I die I'm going back to being a mantis The, the reincarnation aspect seems to come into, uh, into the um, theory quite a bit, which I do believe in also. Um, do you hear many um, first-hand um, stories about reincarnation? I mean, for, your, for instance, yourself, do, do you know of any past lives that you've had? Um, yes and yes. Um, <laughs> I will say that um, I started to look into reincarnation, um, you know, in my early 20s, really, even though my religion at the time, which isn't my religion anymore because I'm not religious in that sense, um, said that there was no such thing. But I was reading accounts of people that had had experiences where they um, remembered past lives. And so someone offered to regress me, and I did it out of curiosity more than anything else. 
And what was weird is I actually remembered three lifetimes, one of them as a Roman soldier, I might add. And I came out with things that I had no conscious re, you know, understanding of. I was using terms that I would never use. And one of them was because of being a Roman soldier, I ended up in Hadrian's Wall and protecting it from what I called the, were the barbarians. Now, I would never have called the Scots the barbarians <laughs> in a million years, but apparently that's what the Romans called them, was yeah. barbarians. Yeah, I, thought, I, think, I, I, think the, about. I think the Scots thought of the, the Romans the other way around as well, didn't they? They thought of those as the uh, barbarians. Yeah, and I mentioned all sorts of other things. So I I was intrigued by that, and ultimately I I did my, hypnos my clinical hypnotherapy. They didn't do past lies, but at least I, you know, I learnt the techniques. And I've done hundreds now of uh, past life regressions. And always, you know, you take somebody through a death sequence and they find themselves in the spiritual realm where they reappraise their um, life on, the, on, you know, previous life, what they learned, what they gained, um, what they felt they did well. And then talking about coming to the present life and choosing it, choosing their parents, choosing their siblings, and some of the experiences they want on this particular life. So for me, it's not a question is, is there such a thing as reincarnation? It's just very real mm. in the sense of the hundreds that I've worked with. And the interesting thing is the kids talk about it. You know, one little boy of, of nine, I think, explained how he came here. He explained he was a will-of-the-wisp spirit, and then he was shown three different lives, and he he wanted and found himself in mummy's tummy hmm. and uh, went on from there so they've got a lot of them have got conscious recall of where they were some kids have taught in my book the new human you know they one kid talked about being in a crystal planet with her grandmother another one on a water planet for example in another form and this is as real to them as talking about you know they went to school yesterday or whatever Gradually, their memories do seem to fade in some of them when they get older, you know, when they start to get into their teenage years. But it is absolutely um, clear as day um, for some of them when they're younger. And, and part of the reason they feel so connected to these beings that visit them is because they say they're family, that they, you know, they've, um, they remember them from when they were the same type of being. And what's happening I understand it this way is that um, a lot of these, you know, extraterrestrial um, intelligences that care about planet Earth, and there's many, they are um, allowing some of the souls to incarnate into human form to help with what's happening on this planet right now, this big awakening, this big shift in consciousness. And that's why so many people are saying, well, I think I'm a hybrid. And I've, you know, I've talked about the hybrids as well, as those are having more ET DNA, and they identify absolutely as being a hybrid. And I write about that as well, where some of the young young people have said, you know, I'm a hybrid, and I've my primary origin is Pleiadian or Octorian or um, from Orion or whatever, and they have absolute knowing that that's their heritage. Hmm. Well, it kind of links to what I mentioned earlier about it being a universal thing, uh, about the interest in us as uh, as creatures or as beings or whatever. I'd, I'd like to bring in, uh, you, you know, Bill Rook. <laughs> uh, I had Bill on the show a, a couple of uh, week, or a couple of shows back. Um, your name came up, and uh, he's done quite a bit of. Um, well, he's spoken to you quite a lot. I wonder if you had any comments to make about Bill. Oh, I think Bill. Not rude ones, <laughs> No, no, nice. he's, he's a lovely soul, and we've, we've had several wonderful conversations, and of course we've met up a few times mm. in Leeds and Hull. Um, what I love about what Bill's doing is he's very connected to what the phenomena we call the orbs, or balls of light, there's lots of different names they're given. And I've had, um, in, you know, some beautiful pics of orbs myself, in fact called one in and got a friend to photograph it because mm. I said, you know, that they they um, are attracted to consciousness. And I remember going out in my balcony, I've got a picture of it where I said to a friend of mine, get the camera and I'm going to call one in and see if it comes. 
And so I did my I did my calling out. Come on, guys, you know, show yourselves. Um, and I said, please show yourselves. And the next thing, when I felt it was there, I couldn't see it, but I felt something was there. I asked them to take the photograph, and a meter from my hand was a ball of light. Um, so I know that you know these aren't just particles. They're not water droplets at all. There's been so many. One the orb project was um, put together about the, the reality of orbs by um, uh, a physicist, a German physicist. And so the book, The Orb Project, is really good. I, anyone interested in orbs would find it so. But in my last presentation called Contact, um, there was a beautiful gentleman, a retired pilot, um, Jimmy Jones, who explained his experience with a ball of light. Um, that was his contact. And many people are having communication with the, the ball of light, which is actually, in many cases, us out of body. Right. I've come to an absolute certainty that when we travel out of body, we become a ball of light. They call it the Merkaba, there's another name for it. But when we leave our bodies, that's often the form we take, and we go out in that form, and that's what you're seeing. And I've got, had so much evidence this is the case. There was a lovely... 15 year old in oh, I did a regression when I was in England and he was explaining how a being an ET visited him in the garden and then he said oh there's three balls of light golden balls of light one's granddad one's great granddad and one's I think his uncle and I said how did you know who they were and he said because I just know they're here they're telling me they're here because they don't want me to be frightened so he got the spirits that were in balls of light from his relatives. And when the ETs left in the in the craft, he said, oh, the, my, they've all gone with the ETs. In other words, these balls of light went on the craft too. So he'd seen them. He, he recognized who the balls of light were as his family, his great granddad, and as I say, um, some relatives of his. So, you know, there are so many, there's so much evidence, David, of, of what they are now mm. and how they're conscious and how um, they're around us. And I mean, we're seeing it with the cameras all the time now, you know. Yeah. Um, you see the, the, you know, moving, moving and what have you. So Bill, getting back to Bill, he's doing a great job in, uh, you know, making this credible and helping it to be credible. And as it is, it is credible, absolutely. And I think we're going to find out a lot more as time goes on. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, full, I'm really looking forward to his book, which has been in the process for, well, probably about two, at least two years now. I think probably getting on for three. But uh, eventually, I hope it gets out. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I, I told Bill about, I mean, I'd, I'd taken quite a few um, old pictures myself up at Rendlesham Woods, to be honest. Um, I've mentioned it on this show before, so if you've heard this before, uh, not, not to you, Mary, but to other people, um, normally when you take photos in the woods, they will just come out black, and then you'll take a sequence of photos, and they get all loads of orbs in them, and then suddenly it'll just go back to black again. Yeah. So, I mean, if it was dust and moisture, you'd get that in every photo, wouldn't you? You know, it's, uh, that's the way I see it. You know, and I've only ever seen um, two two orbs with my, my with my naked eyes, and that was like they they were like a red orb. And uh, I was with somebody else at the time, and they said you saw that as well, didn't you? And uh, which was quite interesting. But normally you don't see anything. Well, it's interesting that some that are more um, intuitive can often see them physically as well. It's just that there, it seems that you just need a, a broader spectrum of visual, your visual sight for some people to be able to perceive them and what have you. But others can just sense them around. And mm. I have done. I've sensed when they're there, but I can't physically see them. And that, you know, and I've even requested different colors. Right. I went out and my, my friend at one time and said, you know, I'd really love a nice blue one, you know. I'd really <laughs> love to see a nice blue one. The next photograph I took, would you believe, there was a blue orb wow. in it. And I just thought, you know what? I don't really need any more validation. It's, you know, yeah. it's, it, if you just give yourself a chance, you'll be amazed. I would have to try that. <laughs> but I, I have got some amazing photos myself in all different colours. Um, I mean, really, uh, again, if they were like uh, dust, dust particles or moisture particles, they'd all be more or less the same colour. But you get a vast arrangement of um, different colours, don't you, and sizes, you know. Well, I could tell you, you can, uh, you're absolutely right. And, and sometimes you'll take one picture and there might be three in 
the picture, the next one, it's covered in covered in them. Yeah. You know, it can be as fast as that. There's just too much uh, research done now to dismiss. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, the interesting thing is that that there's so many taking them now with with different cameras. It's like the craft. You know, you can be taking a picture of something, um, and then when you look at it afterwards, you can see a craft in there. You know, you can see various craft or whatever. We don't always see what's there because we don't have the opportunity to. You need the night vision. When I was at Iseti in in the States, um, they had all the night vision goggles. And it's amazing what you can see, which you can't see with your physical eyes, and what you can actually see see when you've got those kinds of glasses on as well mm. so for anyone that's that's not sure there's some brilliant books out there that will show you that, that, that this is real and and i honestly believe a lot of a lot of them not some of them may very well be craft but some of them are actually spirits and that's the form they take mm. i mean i tend to believe um that they're out there all the time but we just can't see them like you've just basically said yeah. um do you feel they're on like a different vibration plane so that we don't see them, like a cloaking mechanism? Oh, I'm pretty certain that's what it's about. We're at one frequency and they're another. It's like some people can see spirits and ghosts, as they call yeah. them, and others can't. You know, it's just a different frequency. Yeah, which again, all. I believe they're and around us all the time. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I absolutely believe that too, David. And, and anyone who can feel energy and feel presences around them and there's so many people i talk to that do um i'm saying well they're there it's just that we haven't yet fully acknowledged the fact that there's a non-physical realm and we have a a modern um picture of psychology that doesn't allow us anything other than the physical senses where in fact we are you know we're a consciousness that inhabits this physical container and that is what goes out of body and leaves our physical body behind. And we will then be, in many cases, that form that we're feeling or we can be the presence mm. somewhere else. Yeah, entirely. Um, about the, the UFO field in Australia, is it, um, is it something that happens a lot there? I mean, are there a lot of uh, organisations? Um, I, I guess there, there must be one major organisation in Australia. Well, actually, there's uh, lots of little pockets of organisations. There's, there's a, one for Queensland that's in Brisbane with Cheryl Gottschall. Um, there's another one. There's a, a couple in Sydney, New Fork, and there's an, another one there. There's one down in Melbourne, and there's one down in Adelaide. And, and uh, I don't think now I'm not I'm not sure about Perth anymore. But they're not none of the, the, There's no um, complete one for all of Australia as it as it is. I mean, I've got my own organization, but although I will take on sightings, because I say to people that have sightings, you know, often when people have a sighting, they've also had an interaction they don't always realize. Mm. And so I check they've not had experience and experience as well. But most of the time I'm, you know, it's 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 more about people having experiences with the craft. That, that contact me but I still get a fair number of sightings so the media do know about me and uh, will ask me various things so I, you know I, sightings just doing the sightings is is not very interesting unless someone's had an experience but many of them have when you ask them did anything else happen or did you feel different after the sighting many of them say you know what I got very interested in astronomy and I, I really want to know about this now and you know they'll suddenly find themselves completely redirected and I'm saying and I'll think to myself yep yeah, all started after that sighting so something happened and it was either a download or they were had to pick up and they didn't realize that they'd been picked up for a, a length of time and something had shifted in them yeah oh, I do feel that these sightings in Australia are sort of match everywhere else in the world Oh, I, I think it's it's global for sure. It's just that, you know, a lot of people never even talk about what's going on. I mean, Agnes here is a little tourist town, barely 400, uh, 4,000 people, barely that, probably about three, eight now. The number of people here that have had experiences is amazing. Mm. You know, um, I, I hear because they know I'm the weird alien lady <laughs> on top of the hill. Yeah. Um, you know, I get people coming quietly to come and see me and say you know the other night we saw things over the beach or whatever I mean constantly I'm, I'm hearing that's just here 
and we've also got the Sasquatch, or we call, you know, we, we don't call it the Sasquatch here, or, or Bigfoot, or whatever. Um, we're called Yowies here. But just, I can see from my window, deep water reserve, and there's a guy there that has constant interactions with a Yowie, um, or a Yowie family, he said, um, and that's literally just down the road from me, oh. or whatever. What happens is, a lot of people don't talk about stuff, you know, David, they're afraid of being laughed at. It's like um, the crop circles, there are the crop circles here too, mm. but the farmers never talk about it, you know, um, and what have you. It's, it's happening, I believe, everywhere. It's just that a lot of the time, depending on the culture, depending on the openness of the people, depends on how much you hear about it. Sure. I mean, the crop circles is a, is a, is, is quite a big thing. <laughs> I would say that someone in your area is probably can actually fake them, but I don't believe all of them are faked. You know, it's like here. And I think a lot of, uh, there's a lot of government uh, interference with that to make it look like, uh, so you don't know which ones are the real ones or which ones are the fake ones. You know, that's, that's my theory anyway. Well, not just my theory. I think oh, it's uh, some others as well, but... Oh, I know that some of them have been created by man mm. for sure, but you know, with with ones in Australia where you're out right out in the outback, you know, um, several hundred k's away from everything in a little farm somewhere, and something happens, yeah. that ain't going to government faking that, you know. Because yeah, there's no point, to. is there? That's right. It's a lot of work for nothing. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and you know, and a lot of these farmers won't talk about you know, what they have on their farm or whatever, because they, you know, they, they don't want fuss, they don't want publicity, they don't want anything. So, you know, for, yes, there's absolutely faked ones, but there's also a lot of really genuine ones as well. Yeah, no, I do agree with that. I, I think probably the majority of them are, are real, but you do get the odd clever faked ones. <laughs> but, um, well, Mary, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you ever so much for sparing the time. I know it's been a bit of an uh, effort for you <laughs> to uh, find the time because I've been trying to get this off, off the show, off the ground for a little while now. But uh, so I'm very grateful for you to for, for uh, making the time for me. Um, I will put some links on the on my Paranormal Dimensions page uh, and the sort of the radio show page for your books. Um, and I hope they continue to do well for you. Are you have you got any planned trips coming up? Not only down to the Gold Coast at the end of uh, October for a Paradigm Shift conference, um, but nothing overseas, I, although I'm doing an online conference for hybrids literally this Sunday, um, and I've done Contact in the Desert, um, that was a recent one as well, mm. and I'm doing another one on Disclosure and what have you at the beginning. of. So they're all online, so actually that makes it easy for people to actually access the information, and I'm putting new information in all my presentations all the time I'm, I'm upgrading them what have you yeah. so there's always going to be new information it's like you say that it's like it's like actually meeting people in the flesh sort of so to speak isn't it it's the nice thing i hope you get to come here again anyway at some point well we'll see what happens <laughs> in the next, the next year or two david you know um hopefully we'll get some sanity back yeah yeah and, i think that's what um, we all need a bit of sanity oh. Anyway, Mary, I'll let you go now. Thank you very much for coming on and um, telling us some very interesting stories and facts and etc. Et and um, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you. Oh, David, it's been an absolute pleasure. And if anyone wants to get my books in England, you oh, just go to the Nexus magazine there because they have both my Awakening and the New Human. You can order them from Nexus in the UK. You can also get them on Amazon. Oh, Alex, oh, yeah, you can do it that way or get them from, I, I suppose you go for what? I think most people most go for Amazon least. nowadays, don't they? Thank you, David. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, I, with any luck, we'll get to meet up again. And oh, I do hope so. Yeah, I shall certainly watch out for you, Marie. Anyway, um, keep in touch. And uh, I shall be, we, we do message back with the pause a little bit now and again. So uh, hopefully I will get to see you again. But uh, you take care of yourself and uh, you have a good night. I know it's night over there now. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mary. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Well, that was Mary Wadwell, and um, thank you very much. And this is David Young on the Paranormal UK Radio Network on Paranormal Dimensions. I hope you enjoyed that, and thank you for joining me. hope you join me again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Paranormal Dimensions is as bright and powerful as our celestial star, the sun. And although it's expending thousands of pounds of energy every minute of the day, have no fear. There's plenty left.
Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. They're laughing at you. They're not laughing with you. Fine. I remember my daughter Kerry saying to me, you know, Dad, one day I'm going to be able to walk down Union Street. And I'm going to be able to say, my dad's not mad. Look at what he said. Look at what is happening. He was right. No, 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 no. Thank you very much. Have a picture of it. Of course, yeah. Which one, that one? Yeah. Who's it for? Yeah, that's Hey, hey. <laughs> oh, my hero. Oh, you're mine. Hey. Brilliant work you're doing. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, it's all yours. We love you. Can we get a selfie? You're so amazing. Go on then. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, mate. I've been following you for years. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, mate. But how good does that feel to say that they're not laughing at you now? They're not laughing at me now. No, they're not. They're, they're trying to ignore me. The sight of these people um, in these vast numbers um, walking through the London streets saying we're not having it anymore is it's so freaking emotional, you know. You know, I've done some things in my life, but uh, you know, this this is this is an incredible day for me to uh, to have seen. Uh, all those years ago, those decades ago, where no one wanted to know and uh, everything you said was crazy, and now you, you see the world waking up on this scale. So, you know, the, the whole COVID um, era has, uh, has been a, a, a fascistic nightmare, but it has woken people up to the fact that um, there are forces running human society that are not the people they see. And we have an opportunity now to... To, to, to turn that, seeing that, into ceasing to cooperate with it. And, and if the kind of numbers we're starting to see cease to cooperate with the dictats of authority and fascism, then the numbers alone mean it cannot prevail. So this is a, a fantastic, pivotal day. And, um, yeah. and uh, a, a day that gives you enormous encouragement for where we go from here. Hey! Hey! How are you, man? Hi! Am I going to pick you? Yeah, of course. I love this. Thank you. How the police should be. Thank 
Rocky Knight. I say wait and see. The coronavirus pandemic started in China. Oxygen, medical supplies, and hospital staff have continued. One of the five vaccines are recently Stage one, you create a problem. It could be uh, a manufactured virus. You want a reaction and you want them to either say, do something, or you want them to accept what the authorities suggest must be done. So one of the agendas is to massively cull the population. They want to reduce the numbers.